Thank you very much for joining us this um, afternoon. Uh, today's talk is part uh, of a cycle organized by some PhD students in urban and regional development from Politecnico di Torino to deepen and share some aspects of uh, critical research. These are 10 afternoon conversations on different topics and have the aim of generating a larger discussion with colleagues and share concerns with other researchers. In particular, I would like to thank uh, Lorenzo Mauloni, who proposed to organize this uh, cycle, and all the PhD students behind the scene. Uh, before presenting uh, our guests, just uh, some technical reminders. Uh, the talk will be recorded. Federica, uh, tell me if uh, you can... Uh, It's already recording. Yeah, perfect. Because I'm recording in the cloud, but I don't know if you can also uh, record it. Um, after we will publish uh, the video on the Polito YouTube channel. So if any of you does not agree, please contact me or Federica or contact Federica Rotondo through uh, the chat here in, uh, in Zoom. We will have uh, around 30 minutes of presentation by our two guests. Then I will pose them some questions, let's say 10, 15 minutes more. And then we will have time for opening uh, the debate with the audience. And you can part participate by raising your hand or by asking your questions through the chat. Next talk, number four, will be on the 12th of May, which is also a Wednesday and also at 5 p.m. Central European time. The topic will be climate migrants, built environments and feelings of place attachment, organized by Marco Alioni from Polito, who will discuss with Tuba Altin from Rogers University in the United States. You are all welcome to participate and in the chat you can find the link for registration and also our uh, web um, Facebook page uh, Distant Talk. Okay, um, today's uh, talk is titled Policy Mobilities in the Global South, the Collision between Global Urban Politics and Local Governance in Mexico City. We have two amazing guests, Ryan Whitney and David Lopez Garcia. I had the pleasure to meet in a previous seminar, seminar jointly organized by Polito and TU Delft last October. October. Uh, firstly, Ryan will introduce the policy mobilities ongoing debate, and then David will uh, present their latest researches. So first of all, let me introduce Ryan. He has a PhD in planning from the University of Toronto. He is a visiting postdoctoral scholar at the Universidad de los Andes in Bogota, the program coordinator for the Sustainable Planning and Development Certificate Program at Seneca College in Toronto, a lecturer in urban sustainability and a consultant. Ryan has over 10 years of planning experience across the academic, public, private, and civil society sectors. His research focuses on the connections between urban sustainability and equity, having been published in the Journal of Planning and Education Research and the Town uh, Planning Review. Ryan, the floor is yours. Wonderful. Um, uh, thank you very much. I I'm just going to check. Can everybody hear me? Am I coming in clearly? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, every so often I have a little bit of interference with my headphones, so, so I always like to check. Um, so to start off, thank you so much uh, for, for organizing, Francesca. This is great. Um, I think it's wonderful that you have uh, this seminar to support each other and to bring in different scholars to talk about uh, a work that's related to, to the topics that you're interested in. I think it's a wonderful network to meet people, to network, to support each other, and to really uh, approach research from, from a more of an interdisciplinary perspective. Um, so congratulations. I think it's great that you have this uh, ongoing seminar. Um, I'm very happy to be here. I, I first met Francesca a few years ago, actually, in, in Bogota at a conference where we were both presenting on, on policy mobilities work within the context of, of Latin America. And we've continued our, our professional work together since then, and it's, it's been really wonderful. 
Um, so today, um, I finished my PhD last year um, in, in planning um, at the uh, University of Toronto. I'm Canadian, but I'm, I'm based in, in Mexico. And due to COVID, I'm, I'm teaching both in Canada and doing a postdoc in Bogota. I'm in neither of those places. <laughs> I, I continue to, to be based within Mexico. Um, and my work, as, as Francesca mentioned, it's really focused on, on urban sustainability and equity and frequently through the lens of policy mobility. So how ideas and programs and best practices within urban planning are traveling between cities and countries that have very different histories and geographies and cultures and institutional arrangements and understanding what this means for, for planning more generally and what this means for creating more equitable cities. Um, so certainly uh, my work currently is focused heavily on, on the, the context of, of Mexico and Latin America and, and also Canada. Um, and, and talking about the power dynamics and, and what does this mean to have one policy originating in one, originating in one place and then traveling and being adopted and, and implemented in another? And what are the outcomes of this? So I'm really interested in those questions. Um, so I, I'm going to speak, um, I, I'm not going to do a, a traditional PowerPoint. I'm going to have more of a, a discussion uh, with you all today. And I'm going to situate um, the literature around policy mobilities and talk about it, its, its ado adoption in different places around the world and specifically its context in, in the global south. Um, and I'm also going to talk a little bit about um, the methodology that's associated with it. I, I know that some of you are, are probably interested in, in adopting this framework. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what this means in practice. So not only from the theoretical perspective, but if as researchers, we, we're going out into the field and we're collecting data, how can we actually use these ideas in our day-to-day -day lives to, to produce research that, that's relevant to our field? Um, and then after that, David's actually going to, we have two papers uh, that we're publishing together currently. One's uh, currently under review in Environment and Planning C, and the other one uh, we're still writing. <laughs> so the other one's still very much uh, in, in process. Um, so I'm gonna start off. Um, anybody off the top of your head, does, has anybody worked um, with policy mobilities literatures before? And do you have uh, any ideas about, about what it means? Feel free to, to jump in and speak up, but no pressure. Yeah, I see some nodding heads. Okay, some nodding virtual heads. Um, so, so basically, policy mobility is at its, its its most kind of simple definition is the movement of policies and ideas between dissimilar places. Um, so, why is this happening? Um, so, this is happening increasingly global agendas and under increasingly globalized agendas because governments are trying to replicate successes that they have seen happening in other places. So this is happening all around the world. So while I'm focusing on the Americas, certainly within the context of, of Europe where many of you are based, this, this is continuously happening as well. Um, and, and many of these ideas, although not all of them, are often based in what is considered to be good quote unquote urbanism. And what we consider to be good urbanism is heavily embedded in the eras that we're working and planning within. So currently certain ideas of equity, of sustainability, of livability, these kind of buzzwords that, that float around in planning are heavily focused on, on these ideas. But certainly we can look back to other area, eras, for example, example during modernism or, or, or um, the garden city movement of, of the early 1900s or when kind of a, a pushback against automobile centric cities started to arise specifically in the context of, of Western Europe and the United States through Jan Gell and Jane Jacobs. Um, so the point is, is that what travels and how it travels in many ways is also dependent on the context in, in which we're living and the places in, in, what we're, in, in where we're working. So I, I wanna be clear that, um, that when I'm referring to, to policy mobilities, um, I'm not only talking about the movement of, of policies between places, but also how these ideas are legitimized and given power, um, right? So this doesn't just happen by mistake. Generally speaking, ideas that are traveling are given power through very specific networks. So these could include, for example, international NGOs, they could include very famous planners like Jan Gell, for example. They can include international organizations. They can include universities. Um, and, and these ideas are, are given backing and are celebrated by very powerful networks. So they don't just jump from one place to another, but rather they exist within an ecosystem and an ecosystem that, that's celebrating them and often has financial gain from seeing their success in, in other places. Um, so the point then of policy mobility is, is to really say that the beliefs and behaviors of policy actors, so, so those of us who are, are crafting policy, are embedded within networks of knowledge and expertise that are both globalized, but also very local, 
right? Because the idea is, is that we're not just replicating an idea from, from Rome, for example, and, and putting it in Paris, but the example, but it, it's more that uh, we also exist within our own normalized and, and institutional context locally. So it's, it's not just a direct copy, right? So even if we're bringing a policy from one place to another, it's constantly evolving, it's constantly changing, um, and it's constantly being adapted in different ways depending on the context, even if the idea comes from somewhere else. So that's really what policy mobilities gets at. It, it, it sees the policymaking landscape as power laden and as not a neutral space, but rather embedded within larger systems, both locally and globally or, across borders and, and across different neighborhoods that are really justifying and, and working towards the adoption of, of some ideas over others. Um, and, and certainly within planning, um, planning is increasingly a, a constant referencing of ideas from different places. Right, and so one of the differences uh, with with the current policy mobility mobilities research is that it, that it looks at how these ideas are expanding more rapidly and how they're being referenced at, at a more rapid way than they have at other previous periods in history. So, for example, certainly the the mobile kind of idea of urbanism and of policies and programming isn't new, right? So, if we're talking about the, the context of, of Mexico. Uh, previous to the previous to colonization, there were uh, indigenous groups in Mexico that were constantly interacting with each other and across the continent. And then certainly there were uh, ideas that were violently forced on the region from from the colonization process from both from both Spain and then later from the United States um, that were forced upon the region. So it's not necessarily new the idea of, of policies impacting practice in different places, but it's the idea of how it's happening at the, at the speed at how it's happening and how we're increasingly interconnected. And certainly we, we see this currently under, under, under COVID and, and how these ideas are, are rapidly going between places. Um, so that, that's what policy mobilities is, is all about. It's understanding that, um, that the transfer of, of ideas between different places isn't a neutral process, but there are specific actors and, and ideas that are constructed as best and that are then circulated between different cities and, and places. Um, and one point that's key to this, I'll, I'll go into this a little bit later, but it is, is this idea that um, often, but not always, these ideas come from the global north. So coming from Western Europe, for example, from the United States, less so Canada. Um, but, but this idea that they're coming from the global north and historically they've been subjected on the global south. So cities in Latin America, um, for example, um, but increasingly in the policymaking world, we see that that's not necessarily the case. It's much more complicated. So we have a lot of best practices or a lot of policies that have actually emerged from, say, for example, Latin America. A really famous example that probably all of you know would be Ciclovia, which is originally from Bogota, which is the closure of, of streets um, to provide public spaces for, for recreational opportunities within cities. And that's been adopted in hundreds of cities around the world, but celebrated from Bogota. Another example is bus rapid transit, which originally come from Brazil, but then was popularized by, by Bogota. So we also see now increasingly that um, cities in the global south are also trading and, and mobilizing policies at a greater rate between themselves, but also um, kind of exporting those ideas to cities in the global north. Um, so we're in a very complicated uh, policy dynamic currently. And it doesn't necessarily mean that because it comes from the global north or the global south that it's quote unquote, a better best practice. That's not what it means at all because all best practices are constituted based on local realities and then subjected to, to others. But just the idea that kind of how they're moving is increasingly complex and increasingly requires the use of a variety of different actors at both global and local scales. So why is this important and, and why should we care? Um, certainly, uh, there are many reasons, um, but one of them, as I mentioned, is that the policymaking process and the construction of a best practice. So when I say best practice, I, I'm referring to a policy or a program idea that came from one place that's then celebrated as, as being replicable and then adopted in other places. So this kind of traveling idea of best practices and, and policy mobility works a lot with best practices because it's talking about these policies that are celebrated. Um, but it, it's important because it, it looks at this process as, as very power laden, right, and, and very connected to, to funding organizations and international organizations and NGOs and very specific government regimes that are celebrating certain ideas over others. And are these good? Are these bad? It, it's never, the, the goal is never to necessarily prove if it's good or bad, but more so what are the processes that allow these ideas to become best practices to begin with? And then how are they transferred and connected between different spaces? Um, and then again, um, this, this is important for research because, because it really helps us understand urbanism as a very specific uh, approach and in many ways a colonial approach to understanding how cities can be and, and should be designed. 
Um, so, so it's important because planning then is increasingly becoming a mix of a lot of these best practices that are rapidly traveling between different spaces and, and different places. Um, however, so while uh, policy mobilities is what our chat is about today, I want to be clear that there's a very long history of other scholars looking at these issues. So for instance, these issues have been explored across, uh, across uh, political science, across geography, um, and certainly um, previously there's been other terms that have been associated with this concept. So for example, policy transfer, you might have heard of before, um, policy diffusion, you might have heard of before, lesson drawing, you might have heard of before. Um, and these uh, differ in, in slightly ways dependent on in slight ways dependent on on one concept we're talking about. But certainly that um, many of, of these approaches previously saw uh, the policymaking process as more quote unquote rational, so more positivist, kind of more focusing on okay, so one city wants to uh, adopt this other policy and looking at how that process happens from a more technical perspective. Whereas policy mobility really sees this process as very contested and very um, laden and driven by power relations. Um, so that's one of the main differences of, of how the research agenda has evolved as we move forward into this type of, of research. Um, so examples, when I talk about the, these international, um, international networks or, or, or professional networks, they vary dependent on, on the region we're talking about, the country we're looking at, but there certainly are, are globalized ones that would include, for instance, the United Nations, um, Bloomberg Philanthropies, um, NGOs like the Institute for Transportation and Development Policy, which was working in Europe, but it's not as active in Europe, it's much more active in the Americas and in Asia, but certainly that's a powerful one for mobility best practices around cycling and bus rapid transit. Um, the media also increasingly plays a role. Um, I'm actually writing an article right now that, that's under review that explores kind of the, the power of certain media outlets, primarily written in English, and how they impact the uptake of policies in different places. So, so it's a very complex policy network that we live in. Um, and policy mobility really gets down to, to these ideas and these questions about how and why these ideas are moving between places. So going now down a little bit, I, I promised that I was going to talk a bit, a bit about methods, right? So what does this look like for, for researchers who are interested in, in studying this and who are interested in, in understanding this, both within local and global context? Um, so there, there are a variety of, of evolving data collection methods that are used within the, the policy mobilities world. And I would say they're increasingly ethnographic approaches. Um, so really focused on, for instance, uh, following the policy, which certainly in COVID times is a little bit different, <laughs> um, but certainly it can be followed, for instance, through, through media outlets, as an example. Um, so there certainly are virtual ways in understanding how policies circulate, but really it's focused on working within the networks in many ways that are mobilizing these policies. So for example, David's gonna go into more detail about this, but in my PhD, I looked at the idea of urban innovation laboratories, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. They're, they're very popular in Europe, originally coming from Western Europe and the United States. But this idea of these institutional structures that are embedded at different levels of government that are designed to bring innovative policies into the planning process, right? Um, but within existing institutional structures. So this idea has become very popular, for example, in Latin America, I would say over the past 10 years, and, and there's labs all across the region now. So I looked at one of the first ones that opened in Latin America in Mexico City. It's called, it was called Laboratorio para la Ciudad, so the laboratory for the city. Um, and I, I worked within this laboratory for 17 months as part of my data collection. So as part of that, I made participant observations. So about how and why people were, were making uh, decisions, who they were talking to in other countries, what organizations they were bringing their best practices from, how did they contest the global realities with the local context of socioeconomic stratification in Mexico City. So I worked from within there and I was an active participant. So for example, I gave presentations, pre previous to my PhD, I had about seven years of planning experience in, in different areas of the world. So I would be called upon actually to present on my planning work and I would do that. So I was a very active participant within this this world and that was part of my data collection and then in addition to that there were semi-structured interviews um, that I would ask I would sit down with with some of my colleagues and I would ask specific questions about the policies that they were using and why they thought they were important but then I would back that up with kind of observational data that I was making right that in the day-to-day -day work that they were doing right because sometimes how we report on what we're doing is different from how we actually work within those environments so those are some examples 
there's also media analysis, right? Understanding what type of media outlets are, are reporting on these best practice policies, both locally and globally. There's also, for instance, policy analysis that can be involved. So looking at how these ideas are represented in, in both official policy, um, but really it's, it's using a variety of mixed methods, both qualitative and quantitative, but really embedding yourself within this context to, to understand. Um, so there's a lot of scholars too, for instance, that will, will follow different policy networks globally to understand how these ideas are, are transferring between places. So for instance, actually attending the conferences that uh, planning practitioners that you're looking at are attending to understand who's attending that conference, what are they presenting on, where is the funding coming from, what conversations are people having amongst each other, how are these ideas represented as being good for other places, and it, it's, it's having a rubric or, 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 or something like that to, to start to record your ideas to put together these complex puzzles of, of how different actors are, are pushing ideas between spaces. And in some policy mobility work, for instance, in some famous policies, you might have a very specific origin and you might have a very specific understanding of, of how it's moved between places. One example of that would be Ciclovia from Bogota. There's been quite a bit of research done on that, but there might be other emerging policies that, that don't have as much understanding behind that yet. So an example uh, that came up certainly during COVID is the 15 minute city, which I'm sure many of you are, are very familiar with. And the 15 minute city is actually basically a combination of many best practices that have already been existing, but marketed and brought together in this new concept. So this is one that has really emerged uh, during COVID and certainly where, where did it come from? How is it being pushed? Certainly in North America, for example, in Canadian and American cities, it's everywhere now in the media um, and increasingly so in Latin America. So this is one of these examples that, that they constantly emerge and generally they have uh, they have kind of sexy names associated with them or, or they're kind of on the cutting edge of, of what's considered good urbanism currently. And the way that they move between spaces is really what policy mobilities is all about to understand these processes. Um, so going down now a little bit into the context of, of the global south. So as I alluded to earlier, Within the Global South, there's a long history of, of, of projects and ideas and policies and, and everything being forced upon the region very violently from, from other countries, primarily in the Global North. Um, so certainly, as I mentioned earlier, there's, there's also a lot of policies now that are emerging and being celebrated from the context of the Global South and then are moving between cities within the Global South and the cities in the Global North. Of course, with the idea of, of the Global North still influencing uh, the global south. So there's this very complex uh, embedded environment of policy making. Um, and certainly within that, within that uh, context, one thing that I find interesting, and I'm, I'm publishing a paper on it currently, is this idea that uh, there's still always this, there tends to be this legitimization that still comes from the north. So even though, for instance, there might be increasing referencing of, of ideas from the global south, often the funding agencies or the media sources that report on these ideas still have uh, connections to urbanism agendas from the global north. So it's never as easy as saying, oh, well, this emerged from the global south, so that means it's better from the global south. We're, we're in an environment where, where everything is constantly connected and there are different agendas in different places that are constantly intersecting. Um, so it's really an important opportunity to, to understand uh, how this relates to planning and, and southern urbanism. And if we're conceptualizing best practices as, as good for the city, where are they coming from still, even if they're from the global south, and how are they being circulated and, and understood as good for the city, and who is winning from having them adopted, and what are the outcomes of these actual policies when they're implemented on the ground? So this is certainly something that um, I'm, I'm very interested in, and David as well. David's going to talk about, about our, our research together, um, which really starts to, to point at these questions and really try to understand uh, what it means in terms of, of our case, which we heavily are working currently on, on Mexico City, uh, which has been uh, a big adopter of, of best practices over, over the past uh, 15 years and continues to be so, and is also establishing itself regionally and increasingly globally as a center of export of best practices. So a lot of cities, for instance, around the Latin American region now are looking to Mexico City to see the policies that it's using and, and it's exporting. So it's a big, circular process of, of how these ideas are, are understood, contextualized, embedded, exported, and imported between different places and, and different contexts. Um, so that was my Cole's note um, introduction to the to policy mobilities. Um, Francesca, I'm not sure if, if you want to give time for questions now or if you want to wait for, for the end after David's uh, presentation, but, but whatever you, you see fit is fine by me. Yeah, maybe we can proceed with David's presentation and then we can, uh, we can have all the questions at, at the end. Perfect. Okay, 
um, let me introduce David. David is an urban policy specialist and a university lecturer. He holds a PhD in public and uh, urban policy from the new school and a master in comparative public policy from Flaxo, Mexico. He is adjunct faculty at the urban studies department in Queens College, where he teaches urban politics and urban research methods. David's research explores policy interactions in the production of urban equalities, urban political economy, the distributional effects of urban policies, the role of knowledge and expertise in contemporary urban governmentality, and institutional arrangements for urban governance. His current research project explores policy interactions in the production of inequalities of accessibility to jobs in La Paz, Bolivia, and the shift of urban structure in Latin American cities. He has been a consultant for the German Agency for International Cooperation, the Latin American Development Bank, and the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa. David, if you want to share your uh, presentation. Uh, yeah, thank you, Francesca. Um, well, first of all, I want to thank Francesca for the invitation. I want to thank the organizers um, also for having us here. And I want to thank Ryan for this wonderful introduction to the literature on policy and mobilities. I do have a presentation. I have four slides and I want, I'm want i going to share them. But before doing that, um, I just want to um, jump in what Ryan was presenting, um, contextualizing this literature on policy and mobilities. So for those of you that are a little bit more interested in the policy side um, of urban planning, right, in, in, in urban policy, um, um, you might be familiar with um, uh, this edited volume on the theories of the policy process, right? Edited by Sabatier and Weibo. They're in their fourth edition now. And, and what I bring this volume because um, this book usually publishes the most influential theories in the policy process that are the ones that are being more, more productive in academic circles. And um, there's usually a chapter about policy transfer. Um, um, and policy diffusion, which is uh, a way to look at the policy process in which um, local actors win support for specific policies by resorting to best practices in, in other places of the world, right? And that's how they engage in the politics of the policy process. So just to situate the literature and policy mobilities within that literature, um, I, I I think that the literature on policy mobilities has a lot of potential to contribute to that literature of policy diffusion and policy transfer, right? By all the studies that are being made um, currently in the field of policy mobilities and all the learning that is being produced, um, there's a great potential to keep contributing to understanding the policy process um, in urban planning and um, the connections between those global networks of um, best practices and knowledge with what happens in the local policy process, right? So just trying to situate that literature there. So I'm going to share my slides. And, um, um, you know, the thing is that Ryan and I, um, we, started to, we started to work together on this topic because Ryan was doing his PhD um, studying the Laboratorio para la Ciudad, right, the lab for for Mexico City. And I was in the process of finding my the case study for my dissertation. I ended up doing my dissertation about accessibility to jobs in Mexico City and the processes that produce geographies of low accessibilities to jobs. But in the, in the road to get there over a summer, um, I spent a summer studying um, an agency that caught my attention and then I started to study it, um, the public space authority. Um, and then eventually I, I abandoned this, like um, this case study as the main uh, case study for my dissertation, but it turns out that down the road, I, I, I meet Ryan, we start to talk about it. And then this becomes my second ongoing research project, right? So in addition to my dissertation, 
this is now my second research project and it's been a, a very productive one because Ryan and I are, are working in our second paper about it, right? So this agency caught my attention, the Public Space Authority that operated between 2008 and 2018. And it was in charge of spearheading the um, reconfiguration of public space in Mexico City, right? Um, developing infrastructural projects and having a lot of um, budget and, and influence to do interventions in, in space. And then they, they did a lot of infrastructure like pocket parks, um, great um, uh, renovations of emblematic public spaces of Mexico City um, and so forth, right? So the inspiration for this agency came from Europe, um, Spain um, and the UK have similar agencies. So people that did their um, graduate studies in Europe then brought the idea back to Mexico mm -hmm. and um, majors bought it and then the agency was created, right? The goal was a comprehensive management of public space. And um, it, the institutional arrangement in which this um, agency operated was um, a decentralized agency under um, a, a secretary, right? A, a minister, the Housing and Urban Development Agency of Mexico City. So I was doing that. And in, the, in parallel, Ryan was doing work on the Laboratorio para la Ciudad, right? The lab CDMX another agency that operated from 2013 to 2018 with inspiration from places like U the UK and USA, Finland, so forth. Um, the goal of this lab for the city was a space for rethinking, reimagining and reinventing um, many urban aspects, right? A place for experimentation that then when, when an experiment worked, it could be adopted by other agencies and, and, um, and then the lab would abandon that experiment. If the experiment was adopted by other agencies, they thought of that as a success, right? Um, and this was an office within um, the urban management agency of the city, not a decentralized agency, but only an office within another um, ministry. All right, so within that context, Ryan and I start to talk about this in conferences, you know, you go to different conferences and you start to like identify the people that you're gonna be likely to be working with. And we realized that there was potential to um, try to make contributions to the literature and policy mobilities by doing a comparison of these two cases, right? So we started to work in a first paper, um, a paper that we titled um, The Perils of Fast Track Institutionalization. And you know, the inspiration for working in this, in this paper comes from the following. So you see, in the literature on policy mobilities, there's a very established idea that, and Ryan can talk more about this because he's really the expert in this literature. Um, there's a very well-established idea that policies and ideas and programs, they travel, right, from one place to another, but institutional arrangements do not usually travel. Like the policy and the, the, the idea might travel, right? But that idea, that policy was taking place within one specific set of institutional environment and institutional arrangements in one place. And then the policy travels to another place, but it lands in another place with different institutional arrangements and different institutional environments. So the policies will never operate in the same way, right? Because they, they are embedded within very different institutional contexts. All right. However, while discussing our, our, our case studies, we, we kind of realized that, that not really, there's, there's, some, there's some instances, there's, there's some cases in which um, institutional arrangements actually travel. And sometimes that's actually what travels, like the institutional arrangement in and of itself, that's what travels from one place to another. And that's where we're situating our contribution, right? That's the way we want to contribute to this literature to explore and analyze with, you know, more carefully the processes through which institutional arrangements do travel, right? That's our contribution, our, the way we participate in this conversation. And to do so in this first paper um, that we titled Fast Track Institutionalization, and I 
I will explain why, hope, hoping that it will make sense. Um, we identified that in this in these two cases, right, in the lab for, for the city and in the public space authority, it, it was actually the, the idea of the agency in and of itself, the agency with one specific institutional arrangement and a way to work. That's what travel, right, the lab, a lab that travel, a, a, a public space authority, an office for public space that travel. And what, what traveled to Mexico was, um, a part of the institutional arrangement to, to operate that agency, right? So we coined this term that we're putting forward in this paper, we called it best practice institution, which are with the finance agency and departments that travel, right? And are designed to reference the latest best practice policies and programs in urban planning. So we're tracing how the best practice institution travel, right? And then we devise, um, um, a theoretical framework, an, an, an analytical framework, um, a little bit in a grounded theory way, right? So Ryan had some research, I had some research. So we started to like think, okay, so what is going on here? What will be the best analytical framework to really like better understand what is going on here? And we came up with this that we're actually very happy with it. Um, and it's getting some traction. We presented this in a couple of seminars and, and, and usually gets it's well received and generates good discussion. So we realized that um, in this travel of these best practice institutions, we kind of identify that there's two streams of institutionalization, right? Um, that we, we distinguish in one stream we can call it for now institutionalization A, and the other one we'll call it institutionalization B, just to like keep them separate. In one stream of institutionalization, um, we saw the most traditional way of, of thinking of these of these um, policy mobilities, which is the formal process of designing an institutional arrangement for the best practice institution, right? So providing the agency with an institutional capacity to enact their, their desired policies and programs. So the process of landing them in, in, in regulations and local laws and creating the institutional arrangement that will support the operation of the agency. All right, that's one stream of institutionalization. But we also identify another stream of institutionalization that is less explored. We call this, let's call it for now institutionalization B, but what we're talking about is the broader public action process to reach agreement among relevant actors about the nature of the agency as a legitimate solution to an existing problem. That is that um, in addition to a process of institutionalization of formalizing the operation of the agencies in laws and, 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 and regulation, there's also a broader societal conversation, right, among many actors that participate in the policy subsystem um, of, of, of each of the respective um, policy domains of these agencies. And it's a broader conversation to define collectively the, nat the nature of problems, right? Define the nature of the problem and define the nature of the solution and the role of different actors in that solution. It's a broader societal process to institutionalize, right, to stabilize problems and solutions. This is not new. This is the public action uh, theory, uh, literature from uh, the sociology of, of uh, sociology of public action, right? But this is this was useful because then we identified the following, right? Our thesis statement in this paper is that. Um, both best practice institutions, both the lab for the city and the uh, public space authority, you know, in their longing to deliver fast and be effective fast and have a lot of budget and a lot of power and autonomy to decide their projects and, and deliver fast, right? Because majors, they, they create an agency, they wanted to, to deliver fast. In what happened is that majors and the agencies 
did very well the first stream of institutionalization, right, to formalize the agencies within inst an institutional arrangement in law and regulation, but they skipped the second stream of institutionalization. They didn't engage in this broader societal conversation to convince relevant actors of the legitimacy of these two agencies, the merit of the problem that they will have to tackle and the legitimacy of the agency as a solution. So they just skipped it, right? We call this depoliticizing the policy process. So our thesis statement goes like this, both agencies attempt to depoliticize the urban planning process by skipping that broader public action process, that institutionalization be that I was talking about to be flexible to the needs of best practices, best practice urbanism, right? To deliver fast. And in skipping this process, however, they lacked to engage in the necessary buy-in, right? From other city government actors and from other social uh, local actors to see each of these agencies as legitimate. Um, which eventually led to their closure, right? Something that I didn't mention at the beginning is that both agencies were shut down in 2018 by an incoming major, right? Both agencies were shut down like immediately. So we're, we're saying, okay, but why, right? Why are these agencies being shut down, right? Just like this. So our answer to this is that, well, we call, we call fast track institutionalization, this process of skipping the second stream of institutionalization in order to just put the agency in operation, right? We call it fast track institutionalization. And our thesis statement is that fast track institutionalization, it seems, leads to the demise of the agencies because as they're not like accepted, um, adopted, legitimized to a broader spectrum of actors within urban planning in Mexico City, um, the change of government was enough to just made these two agencies disappear, right? They were not legitimized as um, feasible and useful policy solutions. So when a new major comes, they just have to go. So fast track institutionalization leads to the demise of the, of the agencies. Now our second paper is still, um, uh, we're still cooking this, right? We're still working on this. Um, in this paper, we're doing something different. Um, um, so this is an extension of our, of our, our analysis of the travel of institutional arrangements. But I think what, it, what is inspiring this, this new paper is that, um, and this is also like a finding that we got from the research, right? From conducting research. So we're not, we're not doing some like, um, like grounded theory to, to make sense of some findings that we saw, right? So it seems that when institutional arrangements travel of these agencies, they don't just land in Mexico City and then they start to operate as a, as a copy paste from other cities, right? No, when they arrive at Mexico City, there's pre-existing institutional arrangements there at many levels, institutions at many levels, and then they merge. Like the institutional arrangements that travels merges with the institutional arrangements that, ex that pre-existed in the, in the city that, that is importing this, these great practices. And it merges into something different, into something new. And we coined a term to try to describe this process, um, the term institutional syncretism, right? Syncretism, a term inspired from colonial studies, religion studies, where, um, a foreign religion is imposed by um, colonizer forces into another territory, but there's existing um, religion beliefs in the, in, the, in, in the colonized place. So they merge into a new syncretic religion that can, time, can sometimes take a positive connotation and other times a very negative connotation, right? Oftentimes religious syncretism is the, is the process that allows for um, a healthy relationship in some places. And there oftentimes there's a lot of domination and there's a lot of pushback, all right? So we're borrowing that concept to coin the term institutional syncretism, but we're extending the analysis to think about friction because we believe that 
I mean, what we saw, what we found in our research is that, and this is also another explanation for the demise of these agencies, why they disappeared, is that once they, the best practice institution arrives, encounters existing ways of conducting urban planning and appraise and merge into a new syncretic best practice, best practice institution, well, not everything is just um, amazing and works wonderful, right? No, there's a lot of friction. Um, there's a lot of friction with other kind of institutions in urban planning and other institutional levels. So we designed another, and I'm just I'm wrapping it up here just to open it up for discussion. We designed another analytical lens, which is this. We borrowed from um, very well-established um, institutional economics theory, this model proposed by Williamson um, in an article published in the year 2000, where Williamson is proposing that um, there's different institutional levels. Um, the level one at the top of the hierarchy, the Williamson calls, calls it the embeddedness level, which is the is basically informal institutions, customs, tradition, norms, and religion in a place, right? And then there's a second institutional level, the second one in the hierarchy that Williamson calls it the institutional environment, which are the rules of the game in a polity, right? How a country is organized in terms of branches and levels of governments, and that's formalized in laws, so forth. Um, also, Williamson theorizes changes in this institutional level, right? Uh, in level one, in the embeddedness level, Williamson says this institutions change every 200 years, 150 years, they don't change a lot, right? Level two, institutional environment, Williamson says, these institutions change every revolution, <laughs> right? Because, you know, a country like reimagines itself, and, right? And then the level three is what Williamson calls the level of governance, which is the creation of a specific institutional arrangements for the governance of a specific um, human endeavors, right? Um, an institutional, for, term, for example, in urban planning, there will be an institutional arrangements of level three for the governance of land use, and then another institutional arrangements for the governance of water, and another institutional arrangement for the governance of um, waste, um, transport, so forth, right? And then level four is the lowest institutional level and is the level where um, creates incentives and, and um, for day-to-day -day human interaction and uh, material rewards, right? So um, in a more utilitarian way, in a more marginal analysis way, right? If a rational way, all right? So what we're doing is that we're situating the um, best practice institutions and the institutional syncretism within this um, third level of institutions, the governance level. So we're saying, okay, there's a traveling institutional arrangement and there's endemic institutional arrangements that merge into a new syncretic institutional arrangement for the governance of something related to urban planning in the city is located at this third institutional level. And then we want to look at the friction. What is the friction of that specific institutional arrangement? for the governance of public space and for the governance of innovation in Mexico City, the friction of that specific arrangement with other institutions at the embeddedness level, at the institutional environment level, and at the resource allocation level, because, and I'm gonna wrap it up here to open it up for discussion, but our finding is that there's a lot of friction, both agencies with other institutions, uh, um, in urban planning at other institutional levels. And this friction is eventually leading to their demise as well, is contributing to their demise. Um, incoming major says, well, this is too problematic. This is creating too much problems. We could do this better in a different way. Let's do it differently. And then they close these best practice institutions, right? I could come up with examples of the research and, and, and I'm sure Ryan has some examples, but I don't want to keep talking. Uh, so I want to open it up for discussion. So I'll leave it here and, and let's discuss this. Let's discuss this. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, David. And thank you, Ryan. 
it's always a pleasure <laughs> to discuss with you. And actually, every time I learn a lot from you both. So, so thank you very much for, uh, for being here today. Um, maybe before opening the floor to the questions from the audience, and you can raise your hand or write your questions in the chat. Um, I would like um, just to pose you a question or maybe a reflection um, because for, um, for a paper I'm working on uh, uh, the analysis of the process of uh, national urban policies and national urban agendas in Ecuador and Bolivia. And actually, I am wondering if this uh, fast track institutionalization is also happening with the national urban policies as well as the national urban agendas. So uh, they are traveling worldwide and um, from country to country with a framework uh, settled, let's say, by uh, international organizations but actually their um, institutionalization is a critical issue. So I would like to ask you, what do you think about it? And, and then we can open the floor for other questions. Thank you. Thank you, Francesca. Ryan, do you mind if I answer this one? Jump in, no, go for it. All right, thank you. Um, thank you, Francesca. You see, and, and this might be useful, right? I understand that uh, most of us here are PhD students and we're in the process of designing a research protocol and writing the dissertation. Um, it's actually very, very um, um, useful, Francesca, because, you know, when, when Ryan and I write these analytical frameworks, we design them for the study of this specific case study, right? But what we're actually trying to do is we're hoping that these frameworks will be used for the analysis of any other process. Like in this specific case, we're using it to the analysis of these two best practice agencies in Mexico City. But we hope, we our hope is that someday other researchers find them useful and apply them to analyze any other process in other countries, in other areas, right? So I would say that, yes, I, I will argue that um, it is often the case that governments, in the longing to deliver fast, in the longer, in the longing to um, uh, put their agencies into operation fast and deliver to the constituencies fast, they often bypass this second stream of institutionalization, right? The public action process, and they prioritize the first stream of institutionalization just in laws and regulations providing of institutional capacity the agencies to perform. But that's problematic, right? Because there's a paradox here. Oftentimes, agencies, programs, plans, um, laws are very well landed um, in, in, in formal institutions, in laws and, reg laws and regulations, but they're not equally as well landed in this broader societal public action process, right? To convince the relevant political actors of a shared understanding of problems, a shared understanding of the nature of solutions and institutionalizing such policies as a legitimate solution, right? So yeah, I will argue that it might be the case that many national governments just bypass this broader public action process um, and that's problematic. Right. Uh, Ryan, I don't know if you want to jump in here. I, I agree with, with what you said. And Francesca, I know a bit about this paper you're talking about. We, we've had some, some discussions about it before. And I, I certainly think that it could provide a lens to understand these processes and, and how they're, they're evolving um, and leading to, to different results in different spaces. So certainly, I think this kind of process of, of fast track institutionalization Although we're looking at the municipal government, I think it's a concept that can be applied across a variety of scales of, of governance and, and, and of government. Um, so in your case, I, I think perhaps it could be it could be uh, useful within that process. The paper is currently under review. Um, we hope to have a, a positive <laughs> a positive.
positive outcome and I can certainly certainly share it with you in its final form when when and if it comes out. And if you want to talk about it further, for sure, you can reach out to, to David or I. And just as a heads up, um, I also coordinate a, a policy mobility working group um, that David and Francesca are, are part of. Um, so if any of you, for example, are, are looking to, to join a, a group for support in terms of your writing, we, we tend to set up writing goals and then we provide drafts of our work to the larger group for feedback. Um, you can reach out to me. I'll, I'll type my email in the chat. Um, and we can certainly coordinate uh, your your arrival. But Francesca, that could be something that you could bring, for instance, to the policy mobility working group, and we could all work on this idea together to think more clearly about about what the applications could be to to your context. Yeah, actually, it's a wonderful space for uh, for discussion, and for me, it's really important because learning from uh, someone as Ryan and David and the other participants uh, who are in a, in a stage, let's say after their PhD process, it's really helpful. So uh, I encourage you all PhD students for organizing other writing groups, or if you are interested, as Ryan said, we can, uh, we can see how to include, uh, include you in our working group. Uh, just uh, one question more uh, on, in terms of uh, methodology, because you recently achieved your PhD degree, so you, you recently <laughs> passed through the process. Uh, what kind of uh, suggestions can you give us? I know that uh, you already said something, but maybe um, to say something more general and applicable for PhD students leading with different topics. I don't know if David or Ryan or both. Some interesting do we, suggestions. Do we Can have hours? <laughs> <laughs> Um, so just to clarify, Francesca, are you looking for kind of advice in terms of, of scoping your PhD or how to find a position after the PhD or how to defend it? Like what, what aspect of, of the process? So I can target it a little bit more. Yeah, in terms of methodology, uh, organizing our research, because here we are PhD ah. students from our first, second and third year. So maybe. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Sure. I would say. Um, so one thing that really helped me, I'm, I'm super goal oriented. Um, so to really have very specific um, deadlines associated with all the different aspects of my PhD and not get overwhelmed by the entire process, right? Because it's a very long and it's a very big process. And I think it's really important to break it up into small digestible chunks and small little goals that you work towards bit by bit by bit by bit, but also seeing kind of the larger connection to the larger overall goal, which is the successful completion of, of the PhD. So let me give you an example of, of how I did that and, and what I found personally useful and, and certainly several of my, my colleagues found this useful as well. Um, so I did an article style dissertation as opposed to a manuscript style. Um, the reason why I did that because increasingly in, in academic to become competitive in, in the market, you have to be publishing. Um, and increasingly the pressures on junior academics to publish and to actually get your foot in the door when there's so few positions and there's so much competition for them it is unfortunately that means that there's a lot of pressure on you to, to publish so what i decided to do is i went with the the article style as opposed to the manuscript style um, and the article style at least in my phd program the expectations were that you produce three articles that were of publishable standard. So this varies across programs. Sometimes it's four articles, sometimes it's two, sometimes they have to be published before graduation, sometimes not. The expectations in my program were three articles that were of publishable quality, meaning that they didn't have to be published, but that they could be after. So before I graduated, I had one published and I have three others um, coming from the thesis that are currently under, under revision um, and under review. But what that helped me do the article style is really break out very specific contributions. So for instance, I had three articles all related to policy mobility. Then I had an introduction, my overall theory and my conclusions. And I fit my three articles into that larger structure. And what the three articles allowed me to do was to really pick out specific research questions associated to my larger question of my thesis. So I had one article that was looking at uh, the spatial outcomes of livable streets 
this one has been published um, on on um, so livable streets meaning cycling infrastructure, pedestrian infrastructure, public space infrastructure, and where these investments are geographically located within the city and how that relates to equity. So this was one. I carved out kind of this this question that I thought was important from my data, and I could focus on that as as one goal. The second article looked at this idea I called trendy urbanists. Uh, this one has been accepted for publication, but uh, it hasn't come out yet. Um, so talking about how a very globalized, um, globally educated type of urbanist is implementing best practices within Mexico City. So then this article allowed me to really focus on, on kind of this second output. And then the third that I, I'm focusing out, which is under, under revision, was about the role of English, la English, English language media within the circulation of best practices. So this contributes to policy mobility specifically around uh, media and how media is impacting the uptake of, of best practices. So each one of these chapters and articles had their own empirical section, had their own theoretical section that related to the overall whole. So breaking it down into kind of these digestible pieces really allowed me in my goal-oriented personality <laughs> to focus on, on specific ideas, but also see how it relates to the overall core. And so I really set up deadlines for myself, small little deadlines that were very digestible that led towards that overall completion. Um, and I also tried to build up a, a network of, of, of people, so my peers um, and also academics who, who supported me with their time, right? Because academics are so busy. Um, it's really important to find people um, who, can, who can support you throughout this process that if you're stuck and it's completely normal to get stuck, that you can reach out to and be like, hey, uh, Francesca, like, I'm struggling with this idea. I'm not quite sure how to embed it in the literature. I'm, not, I'm getting a little bit lost in my contribution. Can we talk about this quickly so that I can get out of my head and get into the reality of, of what I'm trying to do here? So setting up these checks for yourself, I, I think is, is really important. Um, and not getting, over, not getting overwhelmed by the overall overall process. Um, and I think it's completely normal, for example, because we're dealing with so many different ideas and, and literatures to get a little bit lost along the way because we, this new idea comes up that we find out about and then it kind of takes us off of our path, but always going back to your, your research questions or your ideas that you're trying to explore and really seeing the literature through that lens as opposed to letting the literature kind of control your ideas, using the literature as a tool to focus in on, on really the questions that, that you want to, to contribute to. Um, so in terms of, 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 of kind of the method of, of structuring the thesis, I found, found that very useful. Um, and then using your methods that you're using, for example, for your overall thesis as a way to, to conceptualize what you can do with the data that, that you're using. Um, so also in, in my program, we had three different phases. So the first phase was coursework. The second phase was comprehensive exam. So we had to devise a reading list and have an exam on that. The third step was proposal defense. So for your actual thesis, sorry, there was four. And then the fourth was um, actual, the writing and defending of your thesis. Um, so the structure of that as well also helped me break it down into digestible pieces and kind of set up little goals as I, as I go along the way. And I think what's important to it is to not give yourself pressure. Like my thesis is still changing. <laughs> I'm defended and like I've, I'm graduated, but like honestly, like during the publishing process, like it's evolved still. Um, so it's in a constant state of evolution. So kind of like this focused idea on, on a finished end date that's, that's perfect and, and that doesn't need changes. I don't think that that's realistic because it's going to constantly be in a state of evolution. So set up yourself kind of realistic goals as you, as you go along. That's my long way. I could talk about this for hours. I'm going to stop now, but if there's any other specific questions related to this process or, or marketing yourself or kind of the needs uh, of the larger system of academia that we're in, um, let me know. I also want to say that increasingly many PhDs are working outside of academia, and that's just the reality of the job market. There just are not academic jobs. Um, there are so few and far between. Um, so I'm not saying this to be discouraging at all. But in saying increasingly, there, there's a lot of a lot of opportunities uh, for us, especially especially in planning, um, working in context outside of academia. Whatever path you choose is up to you. But just keeping that in mind as you move forward in the process, like what directions do you want to go in, and, and what do you need in order to to create yourself into a strong candidate to, to be successful within those positions. Thank you. Thanks um, a lot, Brian, David. Thank you. Um, so. You know, in terms of methodology, um, this is something that definitely happened to me. And then I see that this happens to every single incoming, incoming student to, to my program, public and urban policy PhD at, at the new school, is that oftentimes when we get into the PhD, we have a very clear idea of 
the case study that we want to study and the kind of research that we want to do, the kind of methodology that we want to apply, right? We wanna do an ethnographic study of this place. We wanna do uh, uh, interviews of that for that case. So we know that very well, but what we don't know quite as well is um, um, what our contribution is to the literature and the analytical lens that we're gonna use, or even the question that we want to ask. So um, something that I learned the hard way, and if I could redo my PhD, I would, I would do it differently, is that um, analytical lens first, empirical study later. Because oftentimes we design the empirical study, we just go there and then we have to go back to the, to the drawing board and redo the analytical lens to make it fit the empirical study that we did. And like, whenever we find the match, <laughs> voila, there it is, dissertation, let's graduate, right? But if I could do it again, I will do it the other way around. I will spend way more time designing my analytical lens, which, you know, to get there, you have to, well, design your question, right? Arrive at a relevant, meaningful question that is derived from a meaningful and relevant research problem, right? So it's basically that way, right? Problem, question, analytical lens, a lot of time in the analytical lens, which means reading a lot and really being an expert in the literature, right? Arriving at a, at a, at a meaningful research problem and question needs a lot of reading and designing analytical lens needs a lot of reading. Once you kind of like are happy with that and you discuss this with your chair and with other me possible members of your committee and like when everyone is happy with this problem question analytical lens, all right, that's the moment to design the research methodology. The, the, the challenge is, all right, so now that I've designed, that I have designed that, where is the knowledge that I need to answer that question through this analytical lens? Who has it? Where is it? What shape does it have? And how do I get that knowledge and analyze it? Oh, I think that knowledge is there. Okay, getting that knowledge is going to need these kind of research methods and data collection tools and data analysis strategies, right? But we often do it the other way around. We just wanna go there fast. I, I will spend much more time refining the problem, the question and the analytical lens. And then, only then, think about the empirical study. Thank you, David. Um, maybe there are some questions from the audience. I can comment on the last suggestion from David, which is very appealing, but sometimes uh, risky because I see students all the time uh, to struggle with their uh, with building their theoretical framework, and uh, the reading may be endless if you don't stop at a certain point. And uh, so, my personally, what I usually suggest is to do something in between. Like you, as I, I completely agree, you cannot really start uh, immediately from the empirical work, and you need a solid uh, theoretical basis and methodological uh, uh, approach to start the empirical research. But you can also like set the basis for that, then go to the empirical work. And then while doing the empirical work, you will find out that some of your lenses don't work because this usually happens because you conceptualize something and then you see that reality is like you cannot put reality into boxes so easily. And so sometimes you find out that you need some other bits and pieces from the literature here and there, so you go back. So, so the back and forth is important. I, I completely agree that you should start from the from step one, which is a, like a thorough literature review on uh, who has done uh, research on that subject before you. But then at a certain point, you need to get your hand dirty. Otherwise, you used to stay a bit uh, on the cloud. But that's, that was my personal experience with my PhD thesis some years ago, for instance. 
Oh, absolutely, Giancarlo. Um, I, I totally agree with you that this is a bit more messy, like it's not a straightforward process where you do A and then you do B and then you move to C. You have to be back and forth. And also another reality is that, well, I did my PhD in the United States, right, where the average is seven years. So you have a lot of time to you do coursework, right? You do two years of coursework and then you do some exams and then you do a literature review and you have enough time to think of the literature and then you do the empirical study. Whereas I know that in European universities, you have three years to finish, right? You enter, you have three years, you have to do it. So that's a bit of a, you know, push into getting into the field um, as, as fast as possible. But I, I totally agree with Giancarlo. There has to be like a mix, right? A mix and a little bit of back and forth and the two processes feeding into each other. Um, but definitely I, I, well, this is how I do it after the PhD, like for instance, when Ryan and I were talking about the, this paper of fast track institutionalization, um, we needed to, Ryan had a lot of interviews about the lab for the CDM, CDMX. I needed to do a lot, I needed to do interviews for the public space authority. So then we sat in the drawing board and we said, all right, before we go to do the interviews, let's just like land this theoretical piece and the research problem and the theoretical lens. And once we're happy with that, we go and do the interviews. And it worked wonderful, wonderful. We wrote it, two, three drafts. Once we finished, uh, we felt happy with it. We designed the interview protocol with the specific questions to elicit conversations about the categories of analysis. We got the information that we needed, analyzed it through memoing, and wrote the article like fast track writing. <laughs> Um, it was really fast and send it to, to journals. Um, yeah. And yeah, I, I in, in my experience, um, too, it was a, a bit of this mix, right? So when I started off my PhD, I was almost focused entirely on cycling and pedestrian infrastructure. And then when I went into the field and I started to collect my data, it expanded to privilege in planning. So how our privilege and positionality impacts what programs we value. It went to institutionalization. How are these, these ideas institutionalized within cities? So I went into the field with the, this idea of policy mobilities being important, but certainly once I was in the field, these other kind of things came out through my interview process and participant observations. I was like, oh, this is, this is really key. Um, so then it expanded, I would say, outside of kind of specific policies and, and projects to a much larger perspective on how systems guide, guide planning. Uh, which I wasn't expecting necessarily uh, at first. Um, so it was a dynamic process. And in Canada too, as opposed to in Europe, uh, generally, I think the average in my program was seven years. Um, I said, no, that's too much time for me. So that's why I, I went back to this kind of goal oriented thing uh, to do it in under, in under, in under four years. Um, but of course, this, this depends significantly on the context and, and, and what your topic is. Excellent. Let me see the chat if some questions are there. I can pose a question. Federica, go on. Okay, thank you. So first of all, thank you, Ryan and David, for your presentation. A lot of ideas came to my mind when you were speaking. So potentially I have many, many questions, but I will pose only one and maybe the also the more general one because in your personal approach considering uh, both papers you propose uh, i can see a focus uh, on on something that i'm also interested in uh, that is the uh, like the network into which uh, specific policies might be uh, uh, developed and distributed, uh, but at the same time, I'm also wondering if uh, uh, is there a risk to sometimes um, forgive a sort of special dimension and uh, how a special dimension like the, the specific um, geographical uh, and urban characteristics of territories might influence and impact uh, the even the formation of um, not just the diffusion of a policy, but also the formation of a new uh, institution, for example. I don't know if the question was clear, so please, uh, I'm here to clarify. 
Um, David, do you, do you want me to start and then you can jump in? How do you want yeah, to? Yeah, but I, 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 I would like to clarify the question a little bit. So sure. what you're yeah. asking is, how are geographical characteristics of the receiving places play yeah. into this policy mobilities process? Yeah. Also, also urban characteristics, because, for example, when I, I was thinking about the, uh, the most recent uh, concept and, or model, if we can call it like this, of the 15 minute cities, it's like sometimes it's feel, it seems to me they might be uh, considered, especially in most uh, dense uh, urban territories, and uh, from mm, this point of view, it's also it's uh, very related to the uh, uh, the characteristics of the specific context, and so uh, that's yeah. This is a fascinating question, but just to elaborate a little bit more, would you say urban characteristics uh, such as what, like specifically which ones? Uh, yes, for example, like uh, the population or uh, also the urban density or the density in terms, of course, of uh, uh, text, the urban texture, and, but also considering population needs, for example. Mm. Yeah, I'm definitely going to let Ryan answer first because I want to think about this fascinating question. <laughs> Please, Ryan, go ahead. Um, in a short answer, yes, I completely agree with you. Um, oh, the sun's coming in my face. <laughs> um, these are, are certainly very important characteristics and they contribute to how policies are adapted, changed, mutated, evolved when they're adopted in different, in different contexts. So certainly when a policy is contextualized locally, it's not just a copy, right? It's a constant evolution and it changes and evolves as it goes through kind of the different realities of the local context in which it, which it is. So you gave an example of population, of density, of ideas like that. So it's not just copy, copying it, but it's understanding and contextualizing it locally. Um, and this is actually where the policy actually evolves and, and often has kind of, for instance, different outcomes than perhaps were originally intended based on this new environment that, that it's being uh, contextualized within. Um, so that's a huge part, for instance, of, of the policy mobilities work. It's understanding that it's a constant evolution and it's filtered through all of these different levels of society, of institutions, of culture, of local reality, as it's adopted and contextualized locally. So yes, that is a, a huge and important part I, I, of, of the research agenda. And so thinking about you contextualizing, I'm not sure what policies you're, you're interested in, um, you gave the example of the 15 minute city, but certainly understanding what that means in the context of where it's being adopted. So an example of this, you gave the idea of density, right? So certainly a 15 minute city is going to work very well in Rome, in the center of Rome, right? Because basically it's designed for that. But if we're thinking about perhaps um, Houston in Texas, um, perhaps that's not really going to be the case, right? And so what does a 15 minute city mean in that context? Does it even mean the same thing? Do people even have the same connections to that idea? And what does that mean for, for this idea of policy mobilities? So the answer to your question is absolutely yes. It's very important in your research to, to contextualize the local context and what these policy ideas mean. So in my research, for instance, when I was looking at Laboratorio para la Ciudad, um, they used a lot of these policies that came from other places, so open government, um, uh, cycling infrastructure, um, play spaces, play streets, um, participatory planning. Um, and these are ideas, so for instance, a really good one is the idea of participatory planning, which originally uh, emerged from the global north, and this idea that citizens can engage in a meaningful way with government officials and have impact on, on their policies. So what that means and looks like in Mexico City is very different because Mexico City has so many divisions, both in terms of economic divisions, racial divisions, hierarchical divisions, urban divisions, divisions across the board. So how can participatory planning be adopted and happen within a city that is based and conceptualized through urban divisions, right? So this is an idea of, okay, so it might look or it might act in a completely different way in this context than it would if we were doing participatory planning in Sweden, right? Like it, it's just not the same starting point, it's not the same end point, and it's not the same process. And so that's just an example of what you're thinking about, I, I think, like this idea of, of what it means to impact this locally. And that should definitely be at the forefront uh, of your work for sure. Thank you, Ryan. Um, Federica, what a fascinating question. I'm, my head is all over the place. Uh, amazing question. Um, so 
layering into uh, Brian's response, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try and answer a little bit more from the field of politics and, and public policy and urban policy. Um, so um, this is the thing, this is very interesting. Uh, I ended up doing my dissertation of geographies of low accessibility in Mexico City, right? And then when I went to um, these places and I conducted interviews with policy experts and urban development experts, and um, when, we're, when we were discussing like, um, uh, what were the um, factors making difficult to introduce some sort of public transit infrastructure to these places, consistently every single time urban form came into place as an answer right and the answer was something like this they said well these places urbanized not like in a traditional grid and planned grid like many parts of the city or maybe, but these places urbanized in a different logic um with um you know popular urbanization and um occupying the plots of land and irregular urbanization and there was no grid and the streets follow different shapes and some places are very narrow. So the urban form is already nullifying any possibility of introducing some infrastructures, right? In addition to that, um, more mainstream cost-benefit analysis, ways of thinking of, of policy, they usually, you know, they quantify the benefit and the cost of new infrastructures and it is often the case that places that already have infrastructures, some sort of infrastructures and flow, like some places already have a lot of commuters because they're employment subcenters and so forth. They, in, the, in these models, they tend to give up the best results because there's more benefits than costs, right? As places that have very low, low um, jobs, commuters, flow, so forth will not generate enough benefit to outweigh the cost in this model. So mainstream techniques of economic analysis makes infrastructure investment gravitates to the places that in our mathematical imagination will derive more benefit. So there's a field, there's a literature that you might be interested in um, that is called the politics of infrastructure. So there's a whole literature on the politics of infrastructure, right? A bunch of people saying, yes, politics is conducted by, by human beings with agency. But you know what? Infrastructure also plays a role because to some extent, infrastructure has agency in and of itself. So you might be interested in, in looking at, at that literature and also taking a look at these mainstream policy decision models um, that make infrastructure investment gravitate to places that will derive benefits in our mathematical imagination. Yeah, F fascinating question. So thank, thank you very much. Thank you for your suggestions as well. Thank you. We have two questions, one from uh, Carlotta and the other one from uh, Marco. Carlotta, do you want to start? Okay, thanks. Um, uh, yes, thank you for your talk. Very interesting and relevant. Um, I would like, I would be curious to know if in your research you have looked also at the differences um, of cases where a policy uh, move in a rather more informalized way uh, than cases where a policy move from a rather formalized structure, for example, a, an already designed network governance or a already well-defined uh, uh, transnational network. And yes, and then I would have a, a, a further one, but maybe this is enough <laughs> to start. Sure, thank you for that. I can start. Thank you for that question, Carlotte. It, it's a very good one. Um, yes, actually. So, so one of the informal ways, I really noticed that, that in my research, um, a lot of the ideas that were traveling, some were through come of some of these more formalized networks that you refer to, but others, it was a very informal way. It was based on Google searches, right, to, to find best practices. So one thing that really jumped out in my research was the importance in, in, in the Latin American context of, of English speaking media sources. So for instance, the New York Times, The Guardian, um, Streets Blog, um, 
I'm trying to think sometimes uh, the LA Times, kind of these articles or these, uh, these media outlets that are reporting on urbanism issues, but that's not their goal necessarily. They just report on urbanism as part of their mandates. But that is a way to kind of orient towards uh, what people are talking about in, in, different, in different areas of the world and to kind of orient those, those ideas locally. So I would say that it, it's a bit more informal in the sense that I don't think it's something that we necessarily think about historically in the policy mobilities literature as much, which is more focused on these formalized kind of organizations, global philanthropy funds, government systems. Um, but this is, was certainly very powerful within the context of, of my research, these, these media outlets and, and how they were constantly Googled and looked upon as a way to orient towards these ideas. So the answer is yes. And when I originally went into the field, I wasn't thinking about that. I wasn't thinking about the, the, these media outlets as being so important. But as I did my participant observations, I really noticed that they were playing an important role. And then I ended up exploring that a bit more. Can I uh, f uh, quickly have a follow up on that? Like, um, did you notice also a difference in a term of change, in an institutional change, in a sense, the informal uh, policy transfer as a different uh, way to uh, create a change in institutional arrangement or not? This was also a curiosity. So, Jimmy, in terms of kind of in, in formal, um, can you just uh, elaborate a little bit on what you mean so I can make sure that I answer? It? Yeah, for example, the, the example that you mentioned uh, of actor um, taking idea from uh, media sources, uh, were there implementation of this practice, uh, let's say, um, powerful or uh, producing change as much as other cases uh, where the uh, policy moved through formalized network or not or what what, got what you. is different than got you. that's a that's a good question um it depended significantly it was a bit all across the board so i found certainly in the context that i was working at the best practices that had the most power so to speak were those best practices that had a variety of institutions media sources organizations that were pushing them forward because then it was easier to justify that it was a best practice so for instance if it's being reported on in media outlets if the un is talking about it if the American Planning Association is talking about it, if Barcelona is implementing it, like there are all of these examples that can be drawn upon. Whereas say for instance, others that only had more informal or perhaps were only being talked about, but not in the same way or not at the same level as others, those became a bit more difficult to institutionalize and a bit more difficult to, uh, to, to legitimize because there weren't as many sources to draw upon across both formal and, and informal networks. So that would be my answer that it, it depended significantly because best practices are not all created equal. So certainly for example, um, best practices in the context of Mexico that had a very strong um, formal structure related with them were mobility best practices around bike lanes, around government mobility institutions. That was very well defined. Other ones, for instance, such as the role as children in participatory planning, which has exploded over the past few years. And I would argue there is an infrastructure now, but when the lab started its work back in 2013, there was somebody very interested in these projects, but there weren't as many formal structures in place. So it was much more difficult for that person to legitimize those within government because there weren't as many orientating points. So the answer to your question is yes, it, it can depend significantly on the networks and the best practices. The only thing I want to add to this is an analytical nuance, right? Um, the fact that something is informal doesn't mean that it's not institutionalized. There are two different things. Informal practices are highly institutionalized when they're stabilized, um, uh, uh, accepted by everyone, and, and they actually are the way to um, dispute, politi um, reach political agreement. Right. So that's why we're talking about two streams of institutionalization, the formal one in laws and regulations, but also the other societal process. So you could find highly informal processes that are highly institutionalized. Yeah. Right. Because they're accepted and stabilized. And just that analytical refinement is, is important. Thanks. Thanks. Very interesting. Thank you. That's why David and I work together because I'm much more bing off ideas and David is much more, let's think about what this <laughs> means and where it's embedded. <laughs> we work well together like that. We have a question from Marco Alioni. Um, he says, I am looking for information about the 15 minute city model. 
but it is pretty difficult to find useful information beside critical scholars or too enthusiastic promoters. So what trajectories should I follow to find information about this model and the ways in which it is circulating? What kind of people am I supposed to follow? Uh, because I think um, that these kinds of trajectories also help to explain and understand the power relations lying at the basis and behind the policy making and, uh, and mobility processes. The goal is to create a genealogy of the policy model. Um, David, do you want to start or would you like me to? Um, I, I have not taken a closer look to these 15-minute um, um, model, right? Okay. So we don't have I, a lot I can to talk say. A bit. Please go ahead. Um, so this is a great question because the answer is is that it hasn't been done yet because it's it's too new of a concept. This is a concept that has really started to emerge over the past year and has certainly gained mainstream attention during the the, the pandemic. And so I haven't read anything yet, certainly in critical scholarship that has been released. I'm sure that there are people working on it right now, but it hasn't gone through the peer review process yet. Um, so I, I think that this is an, an interesting time uh, for, for this research question. And also I think taking into mind that the 15 minute city is in many ways is really a repackaging of existing best practices, right? Uh, around walkability, around mixed use development, around bikeability, around kind of the, the role of, of health in, in the environment. So these are all best practices that have been circulating around and the 15 minute city in, in many ways is really packaging them and, and marketing them in, in a new and different way. So to answer your question, uh, there, there hasn't been a, a ton that I've seen done on this yet, but I think that there's a lot of opportunity. So where can you start? I think certainly starting with the organizations that are pushing this idea. One that jumps to mind is certainly C40 Cities, Climate Leadership Group. Um, I believe they actually have a video that I saw maybe a month ago um, on, on this concept. Look at, I, I believe that the mayor of Paris has also been a, a very big proponent for this idea. So what networks, for instance, is the mayor of Paris involved in? And where are these ideas being shared at conferences, on Twitter? Um, I believe actually the original idea came from an academic as well, if, if I'm remembering correctly, I believe in, in France as well. Carlos Moreno. Correctly. So also that academics work, why did they conceptualize it? Where did this idea, see, thank you. I couldn't remember the name. Um, so looking at these kind of, even though we don't have a genealogy of the term or necessarily how it's flowing, we certainly have key actors or very powerful planners that have emerged in this process and organizations that are starting to circulate these, these ideas. So I would look at their work and the networks that they're connected to and to understand how that's, it's starting to, to go to other places. Um, but I think it will be it will be a difficult piece of work because it's really exploded. As certainly in the United States and Canada, for example, it, it's a concept that's huge currently in planning in cities across across uh, North America. So I think it would be interesting to, to start at the beginning though of, of the core of where this came from and maybe try to understand what ideas it was building on and where it was diffusing from, from there and start to attend those conferences and those talks, um, certainly through, through uh, the pandemic, they're increasingly accessible. I imagine a lot of them are open to the public uh, through, through Zoom. So try to attend these and, and, and start to look at how these ideas are being understood and, and circulated. But uh, I think it's a, a great moment to do that type of work. Thank you, I hope. Marcos. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay. Any more questions? If not, uh, I would like to thank you both, uh, David and Brian, for this amazing talk. And uh, thank you very much also to all the other PhD students uh, who were behind the scenes and also who participate today. And um, see you next, next talk, the 12th of, uh, of May. Thank you thank very you, much. Thank you, Francesca, for Thanks, the invitation. Everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. See you. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye bye.